Hello, everyone. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Hey. Welcome. Welcome to Berkeley today and tomorrow. I hope everyone enjoyed the last hour out on that patio. Gorgeous. I'm the CEO of the Berkeley Chamber, and I want to thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, this is our first time hosting this event since 2019, so we are thrilled to be back again. Uh, this year's theme is Resilience and Recovery, and we're going to have a wonderful panel discussion coming up in just a few moments. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few things. Thank you all in advance for keeping your masks on during this one hour portion of the event. Um, your health and safety is our top priority and we really thank you for your cooperation. Um, I'd also like to thank our community partners this evening. First, I'd like to thank our host, the Doubletree, Berkeley Marina. <laughs> as well as other community partners, Minuteman Press. <laughs> Filmatic Productions, who is recording the program tonight, and our Berkeley Rotary Club volunteers who were working at the registration table. Uh, finally, tonight's event would not be possible without the generous support of our event sponsors. So please join me in thanking Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Bear. Rotary Club, uh, Mechanics Bank, and UC Berkeley. And now I'm pleased to open our event this evening by welcoming Mayor Jesse Edegain. Good evening. It's great to see everyone in person after two long years. And I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for organizing this event. And thank you to all the sponsors and thank you to the Doubletree for hosting us. Actually, the first time I've been here since they've done the Doubletree. It's really amazing. Let's give a round of applause. Yeah. So there's no doubt the last two years have been some of the hardest that our city has ever faced. But I'm amazed by the resilience of our community. And I just want to cite a few statistics that I think just demonstrate how our city has really risen to the occasion and prioritized the health and safety of each other. So we have a 95% full vaccination rate in the city of Berkeley. And an 80% booster rate. Those are some of the highest statistics of any city in the United States. And I think that's a demonstration that our city believes in science, that we are protecting the health and safety of everyone, that we know that vaccines and that following public health guidance is critical to being able to take the, to move out of this pandemic and to be able to protect the health and safety of our community. So, you know, after 25 months of living in a pandemic, and it's actually, let's reflect on that 25 months, um, when we know that there's been so much hardship, whether it's people who have fallen behind on rent, whether it's businesses that have had to close their doors, people that have lost their jobs, but one of the things that's been so inspiring to me over these past 25 months has been how our community has risen to the occasion. Whether it's you know, following our public health orders, you know, organizing food drives, supporting the unhoused, um, supporting our essential workers and our nurses and doctors. And I think that really demonstrates the spirit and the values of our community. And I think we'll be even stronger coming out of this pandemic and moving to the next phase. So, you know, we are in the process of shifting from a pandemic to an endemic, but I also want to just acknowledge that um, we are seeing a surge in cases due to this new variant. And so it is critical that we continue to follow the public health measures um, and uh, that we continue to, um, you know, voluntarily wear masks. Um, please get boosted if you have not get gotten boosted. You know, we have to take this very seriously while, you know, we are in a much better phase than we were a year ago. You know, the risk of COVID-19 is still among us. Um, but the reality is that we have to learn to live with and manage this pandemic. And we are at a point where we are beginning to plan for what a post-pandemic world will look like. You know, that's the subject of our program today. And with that, I believe that new opportunities will grow and prosper and we can actually build on 
um, some of what we have done over the last 25 months. You know, I want to talk about business support during the pandemic. We know that our businesses have been hard hit uh, by the shelter in place requirements and, and closures that were mandated. You know, after years of economic growth in our commercial corridors, the COVID-19 pandemic forced many businesses to close in March of 2020, significantly impacting many sectors of our economy, notably our uh, hospitality industry, food and beverage. Um, our arts and entertainment businesses also were very hard hit as well, and many other business sectors also. And I remember when, um, I think it was the Sunday before the announcement was made for the shelter in place, talking to our public health officer, and um, I, I knew the significance of that decision, but at the same time, cases were beginning to rise in Berkeley and in the East Bay and the Bay Area. And we took the unprecedented step of being one of the first cities and one of the first regions in the United States to issue a mandatory shelter in place order. And we knew that was gonna be difficult, but we knew that we had to get, we had to get ahead and we had to control the spread of COVID-19. I do believe that that early intervention, those actions that we took saved thousands of lives in our community. And while it did create challenges and, and economic hardship for many people, um, I do think it, it helped, um, helped us control the spread of COVID-19 in, in, in the city of Berkeley. So uh, while most restrictions are now lifted, we are acutely aware of the toll that these shelter-in-place requirements took, which required that the government take action to support impacted businesses. So at the outset of the pandemic, you know, the city council was quick to begin to step in to provide financial assistance to impacted businesses. So with unemployment tripling as a result of businesses being forced to close, the council took immediate action. On the same day the shelter in place order took effect, we set up the Berkeley Relief Fund. I wanna thank the Berkeley Chamber, the Downtown Berkeley Association, many of the, of the arts organizations and small businesses that helped support that effort. And we were able to raise um, millions of dollars of of uh, just contributions from businesses and residents in the Berkeley and East Bay community. And that was matched by $3 million the city put in to initially capitalize the Berkeley Relief Fund. And with that, we were able to provide uh, grants to 700 small businesses, 63 arts organizations, and countless residential tenants were also uh, helped um, by the uh, emergency assistance that we were able to provide. And this is before the PPP loans were coming from the federal government. And we felt it was critical the city do something, recognizing that we could not help make you completely whole, but we felt it was critical to do something to keep the doors open, to keep people employed, and to keep our businesses going. Over the past couple of years, we worked closely with our business community to adapt to these changes that we've experienced. And I liken COVID-19 to a roller coaster. It's, you know, while we may um, go up, you know, one minute there may be a surge or some, some um, variant that we have to respond to that does change and, and adapt the way that we have to respond. And we've been quick to adapt to the way that we've had to respond. You know, but to that end, you know, we've been, our eyes been, how do we support our business community? How do we support our residents um, throughout this whole process? And so we were one of the first cities to create an outdoor commerce program, expediting um, and expanding our parklet program when indoor dining was prohibited. And I think it had a transformative and positive impact on our city. And I hope that those parklets stay because really, um, it, it really has um, not only helped support our, our small businesses, but has brought life to many of our commercial districts. And the city council has passed legislation to make our park parklets permanent. And <laughs> it just really transform our streets for, um, for, the, for the people. In addition, we also had a slow streets program. We literally closed streets to have people walk and bike and exercise. And I think some of these, some of these steps that we took are things that we can build on post pandemic. So looking ahead, you know, unemployment levels are on the path now to reach pre pandemic levels. We're seeing an increase in our tax base. Um, you know, most businesses have resumed pre pandemic operations. We know that there is still work that needs to be done to continue our economic recovery. And I just want to emphasize that you know we're working to provide a package of resources, not just grants, but also assistance, just to support small businesses that are significantly behind in paying the rent. Um, and I've had many small businesses who contacted me said, my landlord wants me to pay three hundred thousand dollars. And while we know that that you know those commercial property owners are also impacted by 
shelter in place orders and the inability of businesses to pay rent due to limited income. We also have to help our small businesses as well. So the city of Berkeley will be considering um, a package of economic support to help support our small business with additional grants, need-based need grants to help our businesses be, have at least some additional resources to be able to pay that, pay that back rent um, so that they do not have to close their doors. And we see more um, vacant storefronts in our commercial districts. Um, you know, Berkeley is quickly becoming a hub for startups and innovative companies. And I just want to emphasize, during this pandemic, one of the bright spots was the growth of our innovation sector. We saw billions of dollars of investment in federal grants and private capital supporting our um, the 400 businesses in our tech and biotech and STEM and clean tech industries. And uh, I just want to emphasize, earlier this year, we changed our zoning ordinance to make it easier to conduct research and development in Berkeley. And so I think we can also build on our, the growth of our innovation sector um, as we are moving in a post-pandemic world. You know, we're going to continue to put all the tools in our toolkit to support our local businesses as we transition from pandemic to endemic and beyond. And recent examples, and I just want to thank the Office of Economic Development, I think Eleanor Holders here, the manager of Economic Development. <laughs> to our business community these past 25 months. And I just want to thank them so much. They are a small but mighty team that works hard to be able to not only support the, 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 the economic development policy work that the city's engaged in, but to be a direct connection to our businesses. Um, and some of the work that they've been engaged in, in partnership with the Chamber and Visit Berkeley, I see Barbara Hillman is one in the back as well, um, has been you know, the Discovered in Berkeley campaign and the Berkeley Holidays campaign. Um, We've all seized funding from the American Rescue Plan, um, the, the funding that's provided by the Biden administration, federal government, to support our arts and hospitality industries with additional marketing and a $2 million grant program to support our arts organizations. And that provides some additional economic assistance to support our arts organizations, knowing that their doors were so closed and they needed to stay open. Um, we've also increased technical assistance for the um, low interest um, resiliency loan fund that we established in 2020 to support small businesses also. Um, I just want to also acknowledge some bright spots as well. Last year, um, the city of Berkeley, in partnership with Bayer Pharmaceuticals, um, extended the development agreement with, the, with Bayer, which is going to provide $33 million of community benefits to the city of Berkeley. Bayer is our largest employer, and we're deeply thankful for the ongoing partnership with Bayer that started in <laughs> As a result of this new development agreement and the investment that Bears committed to making in Berkeley, it will create a thousand new jobs in Berkeley over the next 30 years, providing opportunities for our young people to be able to work in the biosciences industry, direct investments in the West Berkeley community, and, um, and continuing Bears' position as an anchor for the biosciences industry, not just in Berkeley, but in the East Bay. So we're very excited and very thankful that we have this new development agreement and we're going to continue the partnership with Bayer Pharmaceuticals. You know, another exciting program um, is our partnership with Project Equity, and some of you may have worked with Project Equity, to continue um, the legacy businesses whose owners are retiring by giving their employees the opportunity to convert it to a work cooperative. And one of those cooperatives that uh, just opened recently is the former Betty's Ocean View Diner. Just want to thank um, Danny Ingram. <laughs> I think that's just such a great way to not only keep the doors open, but to give the employees an opportunity to have a stake in ownership. And um, you know, this program with Project Equity, um, you know, has helped other businesses transition to work with walkers. So you know, in conclusion, you know, the fact that we're all here today um, in this room is a testament to our resiliency. You know, we have navigated one of the biggest economic crises of our time, and. I think that just makes us stronger, that makes us more resilient, more prepared for the future. And I think we're now ready to turn the page full of exciting opportunities. So I look forward to working with you in the years ahead as we continue to recover as a city and also forge a path of prosperity for our community as well. So thank you all for being here and to thank you for what you've done to get us through these last 25 months as well. Thank you very much.
All right, now I would like to welcome tonight's panel, um, our moderator, Ruben Lazardo. And if you can all join me on stage, we're also featuring Drew Johnston, Michael Brandt, Susie Medek, and Lisa Miller. And you'll hear more about all of them in just a moment. Thank you, Ruben.
users. And we're lucky to be in a place like Berkeley who believes in science, and that's why we're actually in a position where we can bounce back and we can make Berkeley a better place. Not just more resilient, but more equitable. Not just economic growth, but more opportunity. And it is because of the leadership in this room, and especially the mayor and, and the folks in the, in the business community, the chamber, we're really grateful to you. But we've asked our leaders to talk about the ways in which the COVID pandemic impacted them, both as individuals in terms of their family lives, but also their organizations. We're gonna have three rounds of discussion, then we're gonna open it up for you for a fourth round. So we're asking them in the first round to talk a little bit about how it personally affected them and what, what helped them to get through it. Then we're gonna do two questions to really delve into how the organizations responded and what are the things about what they did that maybe enhanced their organization's capacity to be even better coming out of it. And then we're gonna ask for their opinions on how we can make Berkeley a better place and open it up to you. So that's the conversation we're having. having, having. I wanna just turn it over to our panel by basically doing a quick prompt we know that the COVID-19 pandemic was challenging. For some of us, it was traumatic. It was a shock, as the mayor has talked about it, where we really have to stop everything. We really have to actually stop going to work. Many of us are driven by the mission of our work. And it was a trauma, plain and simple. It was a trauma to the city, to the culture. And we know it was a trauma to all of us personally and individually in our families, and so I'm inviting uh, starting with our small small business and nonprofit folks, to talk a little bit about how you personally found a way to make it through. What were the things that helped to sustain you, helped to make you stronger, helped you to get over the challenges on a personal level? We're just going to start. Aside with, from drinking? Yeah, that's that's one of them. Susan's already started. Susan, take it away. Starting with you. Go ahead, Susan. I thought that was just a given. I'm sorry. That's a given. Please. Yeah. Watch the time is close. What do you do then? Uh, <laughs> well, there was that. White was good. <laughs> Although red was nice too. But, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I will say that I've been I've been running nonprofit theaters for 45, 40, almost forty eight years, and uh, have never experienced anything as all of you, I'm sure, will feel the same way in, like this in my life. It was, um, I, it was. I had the darkest nights of the soul that I've ever experienced in my professional or personal life. Um, when this hit, we did not have money in the bank. We're even though we're a large nonprofit organization with a twenty-one million dollar budget, we earn our money every single day, and we had three months worth of money in the bank. And um, we, um, thank God, had some donors who did step forward initially with some funding. Um, but we looked every month at how much we were gonna have for the next three months, and we immediately went into the mode of knowing that if we were gonna survive this uncertain amount of time, we were gonna have to lay people off. Over all of my career, there have been times when I've had to lay off people, but I have never had to lay off 120 people and not know when I would be able to bring them back up. And it was, it was, I will just tell you, it was the most awful experience of my life. There were people I had worked with for 32 years in this theater and in this community. There were people who were skilled, who had made this their careers, and had thought they would never experience the kind of displacement that they were experiencing, the sense of disruption and disrupt, dis distrust that it engendered was devastating. And, um, and we did this with as much care and concern as we could, making sure that everyone who we furloughed was going to be with the help of the Biden administration, making very little less than they otherwise would have, as long as that $600 supplement stayed in place. Um, we kept people's health insurance on for as much time as we could, but there were people like artists who were freelancers who were simply not going to get paid for years and years and years. Uh, it was two years, there were many artists, never worked, never saw a dollar come in, uh, other than their unemployment payment, and it was devastating. Um, what the outcome, uh, so I, I, we can talk about all of that anon, but but it was, I, you, you asked, you asked? I told how you. How did you get through the first uh, So how did I get through it? Was that uh, I immediately sought out community, um, which I think is what we do in our field, uh, and I immediately formed two different organizations that met weekly, a group of young managers and a group of old managers, people I'd mentored for years, 
Uh, we're, we're my Monday drinking group, my Friday group, was people who I've been doing it with for years, and the information I got from working with those two different groups was so helpful and astonishing and remarkable because what I learned was how much value there comes with having experience and how terrifying it is to go through something like this when you have no experience. Um, there's so much to talk about that, but the, but the learning that came from making community, sustaining community during this period of time was profound and it was the thing that saved me during this pandemic. Thank you, Susie. Uh, Lisa, what got you through it? So I'd say um, personally, this, the toughest thing was um, not only is it a food business, a small business, it's also a family business. So myself and my business partner who um, along the way through all of this actually became my brother-in-law. So it's like, it's a family business. So um, that's how it works. So my husband was in the business and, and, and also my business partner. And um, we really had to kind of dig deep and figure out the fact that there was no stopping. There was no shutting down. We had to figure it out. And um, I know that there's a lot of different rounds of questions for how we dealt with this for employees and everything, but I think that was the toughest, was it just kind of hit us to the core because it wasn't just one member of the family that was in a small business. Um, I think the thing that um, helped all of us was we turned to food, right? <laughs> so we're all about self-care and food and nutrition, and we said, okay, we know how to take care of other people. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to feed ourselves well, eat well, you know, just, just really trying to kind of turn inward about what do we do for others. Right now we focus on we focus on home, we focus on that. So there's a lot of aspects as far as how we handled with our employees and the business and the community. But I think as far as really personally, um, it was going to, you know, kind of going through our own program of get some sleep. I know that there's tons to do. We gotta sleep, we gotta have the neighborhood drinks. <laughs> we did that stepping out on our front porch and I was so grateful to have a front porch that I was able to do that and we were able to establish a community just in our, our own neighborhood. But um, yeah, it's, it's um, I, I don't think I could do it again, to be honest. I might run for the hills the next time, so let's hope that we can stay open. So yeah, so not repeating a lot of stuff that's been said, it's, uh, I was always impressed that on a Monday was one way and on a Wednesday was a completely a different, right? And I think the uncertainty really um, scared a lot of people. But what I also saw, especially coming back through a camera, I mean, it was a lot of confidence. That like what you said, there's no giving up, we gotta keep going. And uh, we did that. So that confidence I got from the people around me was good. But I can also say what, what uh, helped a lot is I stuck to my routine. I actually would get a hard time on a phone call because I'd show up with like a collared shirt on. They're like, Jeremy, you're at home. You can wear a t-shirt. I'm like, relax. <laughs> I know, but then it's going to feel like a Saturday. I don't wonder why you guys are looking at me. <laughs> so, you know, like sticking to the routine, sticking to the, uh, the basics. What we do day to day is actually fairly simple. We show up, we do our job, we do our best, we go home, right? And just keep that up. And it, one foot after the next, and we'll talk about other subjects here, but that's uh, uh, that it. Thank you. Michael. So first of all, first of all, it's good to see everyone, and I'd like to recognize the mayor and his public health officer for your leadership during this, because I relied on that, and I, I'm responsible for more than 5,000 people and keeping them at work, safe and, and sound every day. And I relied on a community of experts. There are 17 national labs around the country, and Berkeley, Berkeley Lab is one of those 17 labs. And we immediately began meeting by Zoom to support one another, to share best practices, to compare notes. And because we have such a high vaccination rate here, and, and um, people did follow the rules, simple things, masking, getting vaccinated, staying home, it, it prevented this pandemic locally from becoming much worse than it was. So thank you and your team for that. We, wh what did we do? We, we focus, uh, I'm a people person, I'm a scientist, public health scientist by background. Uh, um, and what I focused on was what, what were the immediate things that we needed to do to support our staff? And I live 10 minutes from the laboratory, so every day I'm driving back and forth to the laboratory and the, one of the key lessons that I learned is I'm in the people business 
and I have essential workers. We had a minimum, we have, we had nominally about 5,000 people at work plus visiting scientists from around the world, and we, we shrunk to 50 to 100 people. Those were essential workers. Essential workers needed to know they were supported, and I recall meeting with, with our staff out in a parking lot. People were frightened. We didn't know how this was transmitted. We weren't quite sure how to protect ourselves, and I committed to being there every day with them. I would never ask them to do anything I wouldn't do, and, and I've been at work virtually every day since the beginning of the pandemic. That was, the, the key leadership lesson there was you lead from the front, you put your employees first, just like you and your staff did, so thank you for that. Personally, I'm, I'm a, per, a, a creature of habit too. I, I normally would go to the Berkeley Rec Center. Well, that was, that was closed, so I actually built my own gym on my, on my deck, and I'm a cyclist, and so I'd cycle. I stuck to my routine. That's what I needed for my own, for my own health and well-being. I, I probably didn't need as well as I, I should have, but I had support from our colleagues with the, with the laboratory director, and we formed a leadership team to create a strategy and involve our employees and our leaders to communicate clearly what our objectives were, and our objectives were protect their health and safety first and foremost, make sure that we, people were able to transition to home safely, and that we cared about the families. We provided support to our employees. There's other things I know we'll get into, but it really was, if I wasn't taking care of myself, I couldn't take care of my responsibilities at work, and, I, and so we had to lead by example, and, and that gave me the motivation to go to work every day, and I was in a building that normally housed with several hundred people, and I was there by myself. It was quite odd, and um, sometimes I do miss it, and I, people are in the kitchenette now, and I'm thinking, well, I guess I have to undo some of these bad habits I picked up <laughs> so over the pandemic. But, but it's wonderful to see people again, because what we, what we were learning when people were at work is that, that personal interaction, seeing someone, and just saying hello, and seeing their face from a distance, unmasked, there was nothing like that. Now we're seeing people again, and we're rebuilding those relationships. And we focused, we followed the science. The science is what helped us decide what the best practices were. We analyzed the data, and we did all of that to support not only our laboratory community, but by doing that, we were supporting the health and safety of Berkeley and the, and the East Bay and San Francisco, because that's where our employees come from. They were taking those best practices home and sharing those with their families. Thank you, Michael. And Michael started to panel, uh, had transition us into a conversation about what we did in our organization. So I'm just gonna throw a few prompts out and then let whoever wants to jump in, jump in next. So the question is, how did, uh, what did, what did the pandemic cause in terms of either adaptation, in terms of overcoming a challenge? Uh, what are the things that maybe was new that you did uh, to either support your employees, support your customers, or to partner and support the community. So any of those topics, pick one or two and just jump in. We, we have about 10 minutes for this round. So Michael finished, so who wants to go next? I, I wanna comment on something Michael said, because yeah, it, it's, it, it, I think one of the things that we all learned was that we need community. Yes. Um, I, I was thinking about how at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all talking about whether the end of commercial real estate was upon us, whether people were gonna be working at home for the rest of our lives and all this, and that maybe we we're all gonna find we didn't need to be with each other any longer. Yeah. And, and here we are two years later, and people are so, I mean, what we saw during this pandemic and what we're seeing now is this urgent desire to re-engage with people. And, and if, if there's anything positive to me that's come out of this, it's been the, it's the, the conscious recognition of how much we need each other that is one of the shifts that's happened. So, so for, for us, one of the, you know, one, among the things that we learned was hybrid is possible. Who knew? Um, that, um, which makes it possible for people from all over the world you know, to participate in our programming, to participate in our workplaces and all that in, in ways that we would never have imagined otherwise. That's been a thrilling thing. We learned that we can program virtually. Um, and, and so for us, we discovered people really still want live theater, but that we can actually, we can record and broadcast. And we are now realizing that there's an opportunity for us to serve 100, and, what did we figure, 155,000 ninth graders throughout Northern California. Wow. 
using, we, this is our plan, using virtual programming supported by live artists in a way that we would never have been able to imagine two years ago. So what we've done is we've said, we learned something now, we're gonna figure out how to adapt it, we're gonna turn it to another purpose that we could not have imagined before the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay so I just want to jump in as far as the virtual, um, definitely that worked for us as well. Um, I think the initial thing was um, getting through how do we deal with all of these customers that have already purchased seats in cooking classes um, because people book out, right? The, we had a 12-week program that's been our kind of mainstay of Fork and Joint Fire since we opened. Um, and other things that are booked well in advance, as well as corporate events, because so most of our, over half our business is team building. So the first thing we had to do was reach out to all those people that we basically owed services to mm -hmm. and ask them to be very patient. Um, because we, you know, first it's like, oh, a couple weeks, a couple months, uh, uh, okay, a couple of years, no one expected that. But um, we would have closed if people weren't helpful and patient you know there are some people they said hey i was affected too this isn't just a, a, a you know an extra thing for me i need to pay my rent and we figured those out um, but there's a lot of people that you know were able to wait and that is something that i really appreciated we it's what kept us going um, this as far as the next thing was how do we how do we do something for the community we started offering free classes we did that for a year we did free virtual classes um, for people that couldn't even get out to a grocery store. Uh, we would shop and put a bag downstairs from the kitchen so that people could go along and at least cook and learn some basic cooking skills. So that was something that we were doing just to try to keep ourselves sane, keep you know our, ourselves busy as well as give something back to that community that was being you know forgiving for us. And at that time, we were also building that virtual studio. We now have a very advanced um, studio, which we're now able to serve people around the world, actually. So sometimes you might find Chef Olive in the kitchen at 3 a.m. Um, whatever time it is, I'm downstairs in, at my house, and he's in the kitchen. And um, we're not shutting that down. Uh, virtual is something that's staying. But our Berkeley kitchen is now in person in a smaller, smaller way and I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, what kept us going was turning virtual, which will stay as part of our platform, creating a new beverage, which you might see, um, it's called Reboot, it's a wellness beverage. We turned what we used to give to people into a product. So all this kept our employees a little bit busy. We also tried doing prepared foods, didn't work for us, um, but we tried and we did it for about nine weeks. And um, so we were basically pulling out the stops to do whatever we could, and I think that helped for people that needed food, because we were doing weekly, um, you know, deli containers of um, prepared foods. Thank you, Drew, and then Michael will wrap us up with this. <coughs> last question. Yeah. Well, quite. A, I would say a lot. We 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 shifted immediately to we have to continue to provide medicine to patients, right? So on our site, rough numbers: fourteen hundred people, seven hundred are involved in hands-on manufacturing. About seven hundred could be home. So those seven hundred went home. But one of the things that I, when looking back that I thought was important is we never thought it was going to be two weeks. We, uh, we, we hoped it was going to be two weeks, but everything we set in place, and everything we started to do was really setting us up to be in that mode for a good, good and long time. Um, and, you know, they say that constraints are good because they bring creativity um, and whether they're financial or like what we experienced with the pandemic. And I, we saw a lot of that, how people could work in a very flexible way and help each other to get their jobs done. Because the idea was to get as low density on site as possible. But 700 people is still a lot, even though it's a 45 acre site. But it could have easily been a thousand. So, but with people working together and helping each other through uh, telecommunications and even a phone showing this is what the valve looks like and it won't work. And, you know, and then working uh, together to allow that to happen, really lowered the density on site, no on site spread, and stayed in business. And the team stayed unbelievably confident that we could do it. So it was, it was impressive. Thank you, Michael. Anything you want to share sure. about what you did? Um, well, what's, what was most important is after those early days, and you mentioned two weeks, we, I was reminded yesterday when we were giving our external advisory board um, a tour of the laboratory that one of my division directors said, do you remember when you said just 
let's develop a 30-day plan. And I said, yeah, we missed it by about 26 months. <laughs> but <laughs> but the, the, the point behind that was we were, we, were already, we were already preparing the laboratory to pause our operations and put it in a safe and stable configuration so we could, we could assess the conditions. But what, there's, there's several things that we did focus on. We wanted to focus on the people at, at the laboratory. And, and we needed to hear what their concerns and their fears were and their worries. And when we, before the pandemic, uh, working from home was, was a privilege. Now, it, overnight, it became mandatory. We had to assemble our entire laboratory to put, we put together an electronic catalog so they could order supplies, computer supplies and equipment so they could work from home. We, we provided support to our employees so they, every employee was paid, not a person missed a paycheck. We had great support from the federal government, we're f primarily federally funded, but we also had constraints because we, we were managed, we were given guidelines from the, um, from the Department of Energy in Washington. And initially, we had to pause all work, and gradually in May of 2020, we brought back construction because we have um, about $200 million a year that we're spending on construction and renovation and modernization activities. Our laboratory is 90 years old, and it shows, and, but we're, we're investing in it. That's good for the community. It keeps people working. And we were able to put construction workers back to work while we were caring for the families and people who were immediate. They were at home. They were dealing with their children and elder care, homeschooling children. If you remember, it was quite chaotic. So we focused on the people, and it required all of, all of our leaders and operations mission support staff to come together to unite to um, complete our mission. Our mission is to is innovative science to bring solutions to the world. And we restarted, uh, we redirected our research to focus on COVID, uh, diagnostics and therapeutics, so we could help contribute to the worldwide um, battle against this, um, this ever-changing virus. I and mean, we're quite proud of that. Thank you, and I want to add to that, I do know that at one point, I know the city and the state really worked hard to think about how construction, both the kind of construction you were doing in housing could become an essential Past that needed to happen, and I think that opportunity made it possible with everybody away probably for you to get further in your construction projects. You would add another dilemma, right? Had everybody on site, but you want to also give those shout outs to the city and the state it, for helping us with that. So now that made all the difference. We started Thank to you. shift our focus already uh, to our organizational practices, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to give the panelists an option. If you already talked about something that you already have innovated, you're going to keep. You could choose to basically say what you think is needed for Berkeley as a community to continue this sort of progress towards res resiliency, sustainability, and a more equitable Berkeley. But if you haven't shared already something that is now going to make you more sustainable, then by all means let that be your last uh, comment before we open it up to questions. So it's either say something else about your organization or what you want to share, because we have the mayor here, we have a council member. Uh, Robinson, I think Council Member Tappan's still here. We have the OED. So it's been the moment for us all to think about what we need as a community to make ourselves stronger. So one of the things that hasn't been said is that between, uh, the, the mayor already spoke about the, the campaign that they immediately kicked in to help fund nonprofits and, and, and businesses in the community. That was, that, that, that was an extraordinary thing. If they hadn't been coupled with federal governments, I'm unprecedented support, um, uh, many of our organizations would not exist. Um, I, I also want to uh, affirm what you said about, about uh, Lisa Hernandez in particular, who just was heroic in the face of really, really difficult political pressure, and I mean political pressure, community pressure to, um, to back down, to be more accommodating. I mean, we were so lucky in this community. Um, that said, um, We've been, a com we've been a community that's always been willing to self-tax. We've recognized that um, you have to spend money to be able to have the community that you want to live in. I think if there's ever been an opportunity for us to imagine what a community would look like if we really, if we did the work of self-supporting the function of community. Um, we have had, and we have had a moment to experience that. We've had a moment to imagine what it looks like when you actually self-tax well, and or, or I should say, when you spend well. 
And I think we have to, as a community, not be afraid of saying, yes, it takes investment to make the community we want to live in. It's going to be so, there's going to be, I think, a lot of impulse to want to pull back from this moment. And if anything, I think it's a moment when we all need to think about how do we lean into a deeper investment in what it takes to make a healthy community. And healthy meaning support of our businesses, support of our education, support of our social services, support of our own house, support of our cultural community, our education. But this is not a time to back away from that. So that would be my contribution. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I've never been, never experienced an event that really wiped the table clean and said, okay, what are our priorities? And I think that lesson, that really laid bare. So we think about how we involve or engage with the community. The city came and said, we need help here. Right, and the priorities were extremely clear. So instead of us going, okay, we're doing our thing, this is where we need it. And we were very clear too. This is what we need from the city. We have construction in flight. We need to keep it going. Our patients are waiting. We have operations and critical operations that, that need, need approval. We need the cooperation. Our employees told us very clearly what they needed. They needed um, the understanding that they were safe to come to work and if they got sick that we would fully su support them so all the policies that were put in place around that and then some other like this might sound trivial but i got a chance to be in I don't know, several thousand online meetings but some of them were with the community and i really enjoyed the format i have to say that that everybody stood up in one equal box and everybody got their say and the conversations were well managed even with our bigger meetings at work where there's 700 people on the line, everybody shows up together. So all of the seniority and all that was wiped clean and we're all there together. So I really appreciate that and we need to keep it. Thank you. Before we go to our next panelist, I want us to identify Jen and Jen. If you have a question you want to put in the offer for our next round, this is the time to show your card and give it to one of the Jens. They're on each seat. Okay, they're on each seat. Okay, okay. Lisa and uh, Michael. So just as a, a few things I want to comment on, I think as far as the things that we're moving to, I talked a little bit about that, um, you know, virtual is something that's here to stay for us. Um, we are reopening, but I also want to say that, you know, as a small business and also not being able to go and do all this over again, we, we stuck our toe in, you know, we're, we're in person, but we're doing small in-person classes. This is for the community's sake, because you know, legally we can fill our classes again, we can do bigger classes. I think people are more comfortable coming to smaller classes, and so we have made the choice to do that um, because we want people to feel comfortable and and feel that they can bring their family as well um, to something as what I think is as important as a cooking class, right? So not only is it bonding between the family members, it's learning a super essential skill. So I do think that a business is important. Um, I would say that if I was a business investor or someone opening a business, I would never, a, nev a business model would never work with small classes, which is why we have to use virtual in order to actually look at somehow someday being profitable again. Because um, we're still less than half the size of the business that we once were. And I'm not speaking just for us. This is all the other food businesses and many other small businesses because we're still just trying to figure out how to pull ourselves up. And I do want to reach out and say thank you to Berkeley because we did get one of the Berkeley grants. We also have been supported over the last 10 years actually through the Economic Development Fund. It's not only the funding, but it's also that round table that I get with that knowledgeable team that's saying, if you need this, go here. If you need this, go here. What can I do? And they're reaching out to us. So that I, I can't get that in another community. And I'm very blessed to be here in Berkeley and having that type of reception. I also want to thank the, the customers. All of you are our customers. Um, everyone here on stage is our customer. So if it wasn't recent, people are now coming back. I'm seeing people come back as um, for team building events. Your, your teams need to get together and we're, try, we're doing that in a safe environment in Berkeley. We're doing it in a virtual through our Oakland kitchen. Um, but letting people getting back together, whether it's virtual or in person, I think is really essential. And I just seen some super excited people and I'm telling you, being in that kitchen and actually having live people with me, oh my gosh, it's just, uh, it, it's life-changing. 
Um, we were talking to screens for so long that it was just so nice to be able to actually cook and smell food and not see it on Zoom. Um, but as a community, um, I just think that we do stick together. We need to keep doing all these different community events and getting other people involved because it's, it's what makes us who we are. And when I see all these empty venues, um, it's heartbreaking. And so I'm hoping that you know, we can continue to keep going and we can help some of the others you know, come back to life or bring another new business in in its place because that's what's gonna keep our community together is filling those spaces, filling the parklets and actually having people around us. Um, before the pandemic, working from home was considered a privilege. We had very few people that had work from home arrangements. Now we, we have implemented, we're going to keep work from home. 70% of our staff will be in some form of a hybrid work arrangement, which means you might come to work one, two, three, or four days a week. As we're looking forward to continuing this, we're, we're supporting everyone with Zoom calling and, and other hybrid activities. And about 30% of our staff will be on site permanently every day because they're working maintaining facilities and, and construction work and modernization activities need to be done at work. The, the value behind this is that we have many of our staff that commute anywhere from an hour to two hours from, the ba from Berkeley to come to work. And this improves work-life balance. And so that's something that we're keeping and I have a request for all of us, since this is the chamber, we talked about um, interacting and um, reaching out to one another early in this conversation. I think there's more for us to learn. This is, a, this is a great start, but we all have innovative ideas and modifications and changes that we've made through this very difficult time. I'd like to see us come together more as a community to share ideas and work with one another to help support the community and, and support economic development in the region, and we'd be willing to help. Thank you. What can we do to address inequality, accelerate our efforts to address inequality from wherever we sit? I think that means as individuals organizations. You know, I'm sorry, you gonna say no, something? Ahead, you know, I was gonna say, I think one of the things that, that um, this whole issue of being able to work from home or having to work on site has created is a real recognition of certain kinds of work inequality. And, um, and that is something that um, is a, a huge looming national discussion. There are people who do not have the flexibility because of the nature of their work to work from home and that creates different kinds of home life, you know, uh, critical crises that are not being met uh, because of lack of childcare, because of, well, frankly, lack of vaccinations right now, and so on. Um, I, 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 this pandemic has really brought home to a lot of us uh, the, the, so many gross inequities that, are, that um, have not been part of the national conversation. And um, I think each and every one of us, whether it's in our businesses or in our personal lives, have to figure out how do we participate in that conversation in a deeper way. Thank you. Anybody else want to do, say something about this? Yeah, I think it also taught us how casual a lot of our lives were and we could go around about our way um, just in our, whether it was us, our box or our lane or whatever you want to call it. This made our lives very deliberate. And it made a lot of the conversations that were normally a hallway conversation that would just kind of happen to be scheduled and be very d deliberate. Now the good part about that is, it was a very nice equitable piece in connection. That again, you're the, lip, the playing field is level, there's no more reading body language or anything like that, you have to be there. And it really from developing employees, connecting with employees, um, there, there is something there, and, it, and, it, and it, that, 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 that direct, deliberate piece is something that helps us understand where there is inequity and how we can resolve it, and we should keep that. Thank you. Michael? It, it, one of the challenges that we have is how do we provide and assure equity of, of regardless of your work location, whether you're on working from home or you're working uh, at the lab on site at one of our laboratory locations. And we're committed to ensuring that everyone has equal access and opportunity for professional development, career growth, 
and opportunities at the laboratory, regardless of whether you're at the lab every day or you're predominantly um, uh, um, working from home on Zoom. Hey, I'm gonna give us one more question and we're gonna close out. And that question is, what opportunities are there for collaboration with Berkeley City College and students to bring back an equitable uh, recovery? So what are the opportunities to harness Berkeley City College students and also serve them? We got a job for everybody. Oh. <laughs> Oh, over 70%, 65% of our jobs either have partial college or high school education. So we are a major manufacturing organization. We got a job for everybody. We are involved in these programs, um, but they, uh, um, and the more people get to see what jobs you can have and where the science can take you, whether, you, regardless of education level, yeah, we, and again, we are involved in it. And on the equity thing, you know, through the development agreement, Mayor Gein, Councilmember Taplin, pushed really hard to make sure that, that a lot of that money goes to, infor, uh, to uh, making sure that the community and the community is resilient. And Anybody else? And then I want to just thank you all. Anybody else want to jump on this question about uh, Berkeley City College engaging them in our recovery? Can I just say that if Berkeley City College wants to host a convening, a lot of us would participate. Right. The last thing I'll just mention is actually um, UC Berkeley has done quite a bit of um, activities with us, and so I would welcome um, any of the, the colleges or schools to do it. I mean, we're working with students is one of the things that um, we've always done, and what, from a swim team to a professional organization, um, so it's a great way to bring people together. I want to just, uh, just lift up a couple things that they said that were really impactful for me. So one, thank you, Susie, Susie for bringing up the equity question, and also both you and Lisa for saying, naming what we all learned about the sacredness of our connection to each other, and Lisa about the sacredness of cooking for each other, and Drew and Michael both for saying what you were doing to put people first as leaders and to kind of level the playing field and put them to be their servants. Uh, this is truly the kind of leadership, and I agree with Susie, we need to really work with the mayor and others to make this a better moment, not, oh, we're just going to back to business as usual. And I'm just grateful to Beth and the gents and the uh, chamber uh, board that's here and your advisory group for bringing this all together. I want to thank you all for being here, and thank you to the people who just made our house again. <laughs>